Hello there everybody and welcome back to another episode of Anecologist Plays Dinkum. It is Will and Nick and we are back here in the Aussie world. We are back in Australia. We are back here in the world of Dinkum. So of course this is a channel where we are learning more about nature by playing games. And in this case, wife and husband are playing games together. Yay! <laughs> so last time we left off, the, uh, John was right about ready to move into his shop there. He is now officially in his shop, and that means the visitor's site is now open for another person to come in. Now, we are just going to quickly do a bit of alien control over here by stabbing that toad over there. <laughs> because that toad is, in fact, highly, highly invasive. That is the cane toad. Let's have a look. Can I? Yep, there we go. A little flat toad. We could just drop him down there. <laughs> uh, so the cane toad was brought in from South America to control the cane beetle, which was a beetle infesting the sugarcane plantations in Australia. I was brought in to try and control that. And then it promptly decided not to do what it was brought in to do. And instead, it ate basically everything else. So it did not control the... Uh, cane beetles and then just became highly highly invasive and the problem is that it is also highly toxic and anything trying to eat it also would die and so a lot of indigenous predators actually died as a result of that and they're just breeding and breeding and breeding and breeding and breeding and breeding like it's going out of fashion yeah, and that toad only comes out when it rains in the game right yes it only comes out when it rains in the game but unfortunately in australia it will be present throughout the year and regardless of whether it is windy or stormy or rainy or sunny uh, you still have the chance to find them now love we have iron bar for sale at john's shop so i'm going to buy that for us yes because we don't have access to iron yet we may as well uh, buy that i'm also going to buy a new pickaxe because well i need it <laughs> i am getting some wattle seeds okay you're gonna get some wattle seeds for us okay yes. really never thought that as a conservationist, I would actually be keen for the planting of wattles, but yeah. yeah, it is awesome in this game to actually be able to plant some wattles. I'm also going to buy us a stone grinder. Okay. So that will allow us to make some cement with normal stones and also to grind down the, the shiny stones so that we can get some minerals from it. Just going to drop that shiny stone into the stone grinder and it's going to pop out three different things could be opal could be copper could be iron could be tin all kinds of materials i also have and you'll see this in the inventory here all the different types of fruit that we can collect we've got bananas i've only collected two thus far we've got six kwandong we'll get to that in another episode we've got apples of course everybody knows apples and then we've got bush limes which are also known as lime caviar it is citrus Australicus, I believe it is. Um, or, citrus family. Yeah, it's actually in the citrus family, but not only that, it's actually in the citrus genus. So it's very closely related to typical limes and so on. And as a result, it's got a zengy zest or zesty taste to it. And if you're looking at using it, it is apparently used in marmalades, very similar to kumquat, which oh. we recently had. But it's also known, as I've mentioned, as caviar lime because the inside, remember, if you eat a, an orange, it contains all those little fibers, basically, with a fleshy fibers. Mm. In the bush lime here, it's actually in round like caviar. And it very much, in some of them, it actually appears pinkish in color as well. So it really looks like caviar. But then you get an interesting surprise when you actually taste it. And it has uh, that effervescent zingy taste so it kind of bubbles in your mouth very similar to sherbet wow and then it's got a citrusy taste to it so very very unexpected indeed i'm just going to catch a fly because everybody always when we have to do tasks for them they either want the blue moon butterfly or they want a fly yep always have a fly in your pockets oh yes if bilbo baggins were in this game he he would have a fly in his pockets rather than a well magic ring <laughs> so let's have a look here we've got the harlequin butterfly again and we've got another toad which is going to meet the pointy end of my stick so unfortunately as i've mentioned the toads they have caused havoc in the australian ecosystem and you can literally take buckets and buckets and buckets full of them and catch them at one all in one go they really are extremely invasive and 
As I've mentioned, a lot of the organisms or of predators will die if they actually do try to eat that. But some Australian predators have learned that you can actually eat them to some extent. Uh, crows, for example, being one of the smartest species or groups of birds, they have learned that if you actually do not eat the head part where the parotoid gland is, which secretes the poison, then you can eat the toad. So as long as you stay away from the, the poisonous bit, then you are perfectly fine to eat it. Well, they are perfectly fine to eat it. Fortunately, we've got magpies in the game here, but we don't have crows that can come and control the toads over here. Now, in its native homeland, there are actually certain types of snakes that are able to eat the cane toad without suffering any consequences of ingestion of the poison. Which is amazing. Whenever there's something highly, highly toxic, there's also something that is evolved or adapted to actually go and eat that highly, highly toxic species. That is amazing. It really is amazing. Especially some snakes will go and eat these highly toxic species without suffering consequences. Even poison dart frogs, which are extremely toxic, there is a species of snake that can eat some of those without any suffering any consequences. Okay, so I've got 16 wattle seeds. Oh, nice. Okay, so you're going to start your the wattle plantation. We have learned that wattle brew is really an amazing thing to combat, as you can see here, the extreme tiredness that comes from doing things in life. Is wattle flowers edible? In well, I'm, I'm sure that these wattle flowers would be ed edible. Uh, not sure whether there are any toxic species, but I know that in South Africa you can actually eat the flowers of the sweet thorns, which is a, an acacia species. Now in the Vichelia genus, which I'm very unhappy about, but anyway, uh, in the acacias, in the typical thorn trees of Africa, a lot of them, uh, the flowers are actually edible. And they're the same subfamily as well. So I'm pretty sure that these wattle flowers would in fact be edible. Okay. But you can also make the bottle brush brew. In the yes. game, and I know you can also make bottle brush tea or iced tea. Yes, yes. So I'm pretty sure you can uh, do that. Actually, eat them. Just still eradicating the toads. I've got two here that I'm getting rid of. Doing the Lord's work here. <laughs> <laughs> getting rid of all the invasives in Australia. <laughs> uh, but I also have kill killed the brush turkey there, which is an indigenous fowl in Australia so that one was for for eating going to have uh, turkey for dinner yay yay indeed I wonder when I would be able to get a trapping license I think I'm actually able to get the the trapping license the level one yeah what do you need um hunting or I think you need to kill some creatures yes okay on it <laughs> Nick is going on some murderous rampage somewhere there's a moo here. You are dying. Is there a moo? <laughs> so the moo in the game here would be the emu of Australia. And I would be careful with them though, because the Australians have already lost one war against the weir oh, <laughs> against the moo. I will be back in a moment. I'm just grabbing another banana bunch. So that we can have our orchard going as well. Our little food forest in the game. So Dick and I are also starting a... Oh, and I'm killing a cane toad in, in life here. There we go. Great. Uh, Nick and I are starting a... Well, we have started for the past few years, actually. Started a food forest, which basically is a forest ecosystem consisting only of edible plants. And yeah, it had been overrun by grasses. It had been difficult to actually find the food forest under all the grasses. <laughs> but for the first time in years, we can now actually find the food forest and it looks... Quite good now, mm -hmm. I must say. It's a lot of work to do, but we are going to be making progress with it over the weekend again. Yeah. Hard work to keep the grasses at bay. Oh, yeah. To not but grow a, gra a grassland <laughs> rather than a forest, but it's rewarding. It is. It's a nice exercise also to sit outside, get some fresh air, and in the process also work in the garden a little bit. Yeah. Okay, I am on my way. Just killing another toad. <laughs> How many have I killed? Ten. I've got ten toad skins in my backpack here. Single-handedly, I am going to rid this continent of the invasive cane toad. You toad murderer. Yeah. In real life, I love toads, but I am greatly saddened by what the cane toad has done 
to the Australian ecosystem and as a result I am doing my best to keep this ecosystem relatively pristine. I don't know if you guys have noticed but the pathways have changed. Yes, indeed. Because Will and I started also our own private game and then we figured out these pathways are just so pretty. I couldn't resist. <laughs> So uh, we we snuck in a little bit earlier and uh, just changed the pathways and she's been busy building the pathways quite nicely here. Yes. I've got the trapping license. You've got the trapping license. Yeah. Oh, I needed to All get the... the hunting license first. Ah, yes. The crockies must now beware. Everyone must beware. Nick is going to start poaching with a vengeance. We do, however, need hardwood. Hardwood uh, planks. Oh, uh, yes. For that, we need... Well, you can chop down the bottle trees. Yeah. I was thinking of getting the copper axes, but that's going to take a while, I think. Okay, so if we look here at the top, I only currently have 295 permit points. However, in the journal here, we have, as you can see here, a whole bunch of things that we have finished. Uh, little objectives, milestones that we have finished, and they will give us between 50 and 250, I think, is the most. That's quite awesome. There we go, another 250 there. One eternity later. Okay, I have finished and from the 295 I've now gone up to 3595. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Which means I can also get some licenses here or try to get some licenses. I think I'll also go for the trapping license. I'm also going to go for the building license. Um, yeah, I think we're going to go for that because if I have building license too, I think I can make fences. Yes, I think so. Oh no, building license 2 is actually the windmill to help speed up production. I'm going to go for that in any case as well. Windmills are quite useful, but that's also a little bit later. Uh, it seems landscaping option 2 is for the different fences. I love these mangrove trees. How they oh, grow in the water. Yes, where are you at the moment? Let's have a look at the mangroves, shall we? Right up to the north, okay. I'm just over here being tired. Ah, uh, Joy, I've got some cooked fruit, I believe, for you, I think. I, I have some cooked bush lime, so that's fine. Okay, yeah, that'll do. I want to actually talk about the mangroves a little bit, because they are really amazing creatures, oh, well, creatures, <laughs> really amazing trees. These weird roots that Nick is chopping over there, those are what we call new metaphors, and they are designed to actually keep the tree alive as water levels rise. So they're living mostly in estuarine environments, so technically this should be an estuary, uh, and it just counts as mangroves uh, but in theory you'd find the mangroves more in this area over here closer to the ocean where there is a mixture of fresh and salt water and then the trees have got adaptations that are quite amazing that allow them to survive in salt salt rich soils and water but then at the same time they also need to prevent themselves from drowning because if you take a plant and you put it in water like these guys are standing they are going to die they're not going to survive and so what these new metaphors do they are special roots that actually have little cells on them that they as nick stabs the jellyfish to death <laughs> <laughs> uh, they actually help with gaseous exchange so that the plant can have water level right up to there uh, so as the high tide comes in water level can rise right up to there and they will still be able to get gases into the roots and down to the bottoms of their roots as well so they don't drown and then the tide drops and then the whole root can breathe again and it also allows them to grow in quite anoxic soils soils which are really poor in oxygen and are typically very hydrated as well full of water in between all these little, uh, soils in the air pockets so quite cool quite well adapted for life in the estuaries what are these small little palm tree thingies I'm not sure actually. I don't think they're spinifex that have actually grown up. The spinifex does appear to be an actual different grass like sedge like plant. I will need to find out exactly what they are. I'm not too familiar with the weird plants growing in Australia and New Zealand area. They do remind me very much of some of the plants you'll find in the alpine or the mountainous areas of New Zealand, but I'll have to check. They're not New Zealand flax, I think, which I initially thought they could be. I'm just going to quickly eat something because apparently my little one has decided that life is not worth living. 
at least you can take a nap. But Prickly Pear has fixed that right up. Of course, dropping down Eucalyptus at the moment. Now, the weird thing about Eucalyptus is that they do not need a lot of water in order to survive. And, and they can therefore grow in relatively arid areas. But if there is a lot of water available, they will literally take as much of it as they possibly can. And the idea is that they are trying to create a little desert around them over here. So if there's very little water available, this eucalyptus over here will use water extremely sparingly. But if it rains a lot, like it currently is in the game, and there is a lot of water available, this eucalyptus will take it all up. Because it doesn't want anything else growing under it that can then potentially compete with it for water, when water is scarce, or can take up nutrients that it wants for itself. So it's a way of ensuring that nothing else can actually grow under it. They're quite ingenious and that's why very often if you have a whole lot of eucalyptus in an area, there won't be a lot of water in the soil and there won't be a lot of plants growing there either. What that also means is if they invade an area, like they do in South Africa, they will take up all the water, especially if you are in a catchment area where there is a lot of water normally available. Yeah, these guys will take most of it up and cause a bit of a shortage downstream potentially. So there'll be less water flowing in the rivers and all those nasty things. Hello little turkey. I will not be stabbing you today. We're trying to live off the land in a relatively sustainable manner. That turkey was saved by some magic forces. Yes. I am known in my game with Nick. Um, yeah, I have killed a whole bunch of turkeys. Yes, he's a turkey stabber. Yes, it's what I do. But you know, when people are watching, I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, I did just hear a toad. Where are ya? There you are. By our taint is another one. I guess not for long. <laughs> Here's a crocky. Still not sure whether it's salt water or fresh water. Could actually be both. You know, not necessarily has to be the one or the other. Cool, so they can actually survive salt and fresh. Yeah, so there are actually two species of crocodiles in Australia. There's the saltwater crocodile, which is the one, the big old salty that people are often referring to. And they are, I think, the biggest crocodile. Yes, they are the biggest crocodile in the world, uh, crocodile species. With the black caiman from South America and the Nile crocodile from Africa being close seconds. But yeah, the saltwater crocodile is slightly larger. But then there is also the freshwater crocodile in Australia as well, mm. which doesn't go into the saltwater environment. It's generally in the rivers and billabongs. And then the saltwater crocodile can be in the freshwater. And then, of course, they can also go out into very, very salty environments as well. I think I am pretty much ready to go to bed, my dear. Okay. Good night. <laughs> Coming. Just cutting down some ferns and some bushes. Okay. For seeds. Uh huh. I'm just storing a bunch of stuff. Right, so we should have our second visitor popping up here, which will most likely be Theodore. Probably. For the yeah. museum. So yes. Let's just have a quick little squiz inside. Yep, it is indeed Theodore. He is going to start a museum on our little island over here. But this, everybody, is where we are going to be calling it a day. So thank you very much for joining us on our little adventure. Apparently, Will is sleepwalking. So thank you once again for joining us on our little Australian adventure here in Dinkum. Really an amazing game. I would definitely recommend actually getting it, trying it out for yourself. It's in early access, but yet there is still so much to do here. And we will be back next week with another episode. Tomorrow, of course, I will be streaming again with Planet Zoo. Going to continue on with the little zoo that we've got there. I've got an idea of a few little creatures I want to put in there. So feel free to join me there. The times for that will be down in the description below. So until next time, everybody, this is Will. And Nick. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. We'll see you guys soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>